The Assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand The shots heard around the world sparked the outbreak of World War I. The most devastating war in world history at that point. It caused almost 20 million people to die and devastated Europe. Its aftermath and brutal peace treaty sparked the rise of Adolf Hitler and sent the world into an even more devastating war, causing almost 60 million people to die. But, it also changed the old world order, England, Germany and France were no longer the world's leading powers. They had been surpassed by the two new superpowers, the Soviet Union and the United States of America. It's the fastest and most dramatic shifts of power in world history. So, what really happened? This is History with Magnus. Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his wife Sophie had before departing for Sarajevo received multiple warnings to cancel the trip, the Archduke knew that danger potentially awaited them. Our journey starts with an extremely promising omen, he purportedly said when the axles on his car overheated. Here our car burns, and down there they will throw bombs at us. The couple got in an open-topped car for a motorcade ride to City Hall. The car in front of them was supposed to carry six specially trained officers, but instead had only one, plus three local policemen. In fact, throughout the trip, Austro-Hungarian officials allegedly focused more attention on dinner menus than security details. Meanwhile, seven young Bosnians had fanned out along the Appel Quay, a main avenue, in Sarajevo running parallel to the Muljaka River. The motorcade passed the first assassin, Memd Basic. Danilo Illich had placed him in front of the garden of the Mostar Café and armed him with a bomb. But Memd Basic failed to act. Illich had also placed Vaso Kubrilovic next to Mehmed Basic, arming him with a pistol and a bomb. He too failed to act. Further along the route, Illich had placed Nedeljko Kabrinovic on the opposite side of the street near the Muljaka River, arming him also with a bomb. When the motorcade passed by at 10.10 a.m., its route having been published in advance, Kabrinovic asked which car carried the Archduke. He then hurled his bomb at the car, only to watch it bounce off the folded-up roof and roll underneath the wrong vehicle. The subsequent explosion wounded two army officers and several bystanders, but left Ferdinand and Sophie essentially unharmed. Kabrinovic jumped into the mostly dry riverbed and made a half-hearted attempt to kill himself before being apprehended. I am a Serbian hero, he purportedly shouted as the police led him away. The procession speeded away towards the town hall leaving the disabled car behind. Rather than immediately flee Sarajevo, Ferdinand decided to continue on to the planned event at City Hall. After learning that the first assassination attempt had been unsuccessful, Princip thought about a position to assassinate the Archduke on his return journey, and decided to move to a position in front of a nearby food shop near the Latin Bridge. Arriving at the town hall, Franz Ferdinand showed understandable signs of stress, interrupting a prepared speech of welcome by Mayor Fihim Kursik to protest, Mr. Mayor, I came here on a visit and I am greeted with bombs, it is outrageous. Officials and members of the Archduke's party discussed what to do next. The Archduke's chamberlain, Baron Rumerskirch, proposed that the couple remain at the town hall until troops could be brought into the city to line the streets. Governor General Oscar Podiorek vetoed this suggestion on the grounds that soldiers coming straight from maneuvers would not have the dress uniforms appropriate for such duties. Do you think that Sarajevo is full of assassins? he concluded. Franz Ferdinand insisted on visiting the wounded officers in the hospital. In order to dissuade any other bomb throwers, the motorcade zipped down the Appel Quay at high speeds. In order to ensure the safety of the couple, General Oscar Podiorek decided that the Imperial motorcade should travel straight along the Appel Quay to the Sarajevo Hospital so that they could avoid the crowded city center. However, 
Podiorek failed to communicate his decision to the drivers. As a result, the first and second cars of the Archduke's motorcade suddenly turned right into a side street, leaving the Appel Quay. When the Archduke's driver followed their route, Governor Podiorek, who was sharing the third vehicle with the imperial couple, called out to the driver to stop as he was going the wrong way. The driver applied the brakes, and when he attempted to put the car into reverse gear, he accidentally stalled the engine. This was where Princip happened to be standing. As the cars attempted to reverse back onto the Appel Quay, Princip whipped out his pistol and fired two shots at the Archduke from point-blank range, piercing him in the neck and also striking Sophie's abdomen. After being shot, Sophie immediately fell unconscious and collapsed onto Franz Ferdinand's legs. The Archduke, too, lost consciousness while being driven to the governor's residence for medical treatment. As reported by Count Harak, Franz Ferdinand's last words were to Sophie, Sophie, don't die, live for our children, followed by six or seven utterances of, it is nothing, in response to Haraka's inquiry as to Franz Ferdinand's injury. Both died shortly afterwards. Princip later admitted to killing Ferdinand but said he had not meant to hit Sophie. Princip tried to shoot himself, but was immediately seized and arrested. At his sentencing, Princip stated that his intention had been to kill Governor Podiorek, rather than Sophie. Three weeks too young for the death penalty, Princip was given a 20-year sentence, but contracted tuberculosis and died in jail in April 1918, at the age of just 23. The Controversy About Responsibility In 1914, Raid Malababic was Serbian military intelligence's chief undercover operative against Austria-Hungary. His name appeared in Serbian documents captured by Austria-Hungary during the war. These documents describe the running of arms, munitions, and agents from Serbia into Austria-Hungary under Malababic's direction. It has been proposed that the Sarajevo attack was a Serbian military intelligence operation and that it was a Black Hand operation. The Black Hand was a Serbian military society formed on May 9, 1911 by officers in the Army of the Kingdom of Serbia, originating in the conspiracy group that assassinated the Serbian royal couple in May 1903, led by Captain Dragidin Dimitrijevic, commonly referred to as APIS. By 1914 the Black Hand was no longer operating under its constitution, but rather as a creature of the Chief of Serbian Military Intelligence, APIS, and its active ranks were composed mostly of Serbian officers loyal to APIS. The fact that the key officers involved were Black Hand members, that Black Hand Provincial Director for Bosnia and Herzegovina Vladimir Gasanovic, was consulted, favors assigning responsibility to the Black Hand. We also know that the British supported the Black Hand, financially, because they were fighting one of Britain's fiercest rivals, Austria-Hungary. How close up to the assassination in time, this financial support was given, is unclear, but Britain had a long history of supporting opposition groups of their enemies. If this is true, that the British supported the assassins financially before the assassination, the British must be given a completely different responsibility in the outbreak of World War I. With the English supporting them financially, they would also have the possibility to suggest what they should do with the weapons. And we must not forget that World War I was a wanted war for several nations. Britain and France, who had been two of the dominant powers in Europe for the last 500 years, was suddenly being challenged by the upcoming German state, which now rivaled them both, and would soon surpass them in money, industry, and power. This was unacceptable for the British and the French, who saw their power threatened. And with all the alliances that the two sides had intertwined, you didn't have to be a genius to understand that only a small spark was needed to set Europe ablaze. And in their usual arrogance, the British believed that they would crush the Germans, and as one of their generals stated, we will bring the boys back home by Christmas. The German Kaiser, even though he was the one that invaded first, didn't want a war, something he made clear in his newspaper article published in England before the outbreak of war. But, the English newspaper edited the letter the Kaiser had written, making it appear as if the Germans were itching for a confrontation, 
and this article inflamed the British people, who now would be much more in favor of a confrontation with Germany, which only can be called war propaganda by the British. Because, if you read the unedited version of the letter, it's quite clear that he didn't want a war. Why would he do that? Germany was soon surpassing all the other European countries in wealth, industry, and power. A devastating war would therefore be disastrous for Germany, as we all know, that was exactly what happened to them. With tensions already running high among Europe's powers, the assassination precipitated a rapid descent into World War I. First, Austria-Hungary gained German support for action against Serbia. They then sent Serbia an ultimatum, worded in a way that made acceptance very unlikely. Serbia proposed arbitration to resolve the dispute, but Austria-Hungary instead declared war on July 28, 1914, exactly a month after Ferdinand's death. When the Russians, the French and the British started to mobilize their armies, the writing was on the wall. Realizing what was about to happen, the Germans attacked first to get the upper hand and try to knock out France and Russia out of the war, before they could gather and equip all their soldiers. This plan failed miserably and Europe descended into trench warfare for four years, killing almost 20 million people. By the following week, Germany, Russia, France, Belgium and Great Britain had all been drawn into the conflict, and other countries, like the United States, would enter later. The Versailles Peace Treaty sparked the rise of Hitler and cast the world into a new war, just like the authors of the Peace Treaty, American lawyers and brothers, John Foster Dulles and Alan Dulles, the latter becoming the director of the CIA and one of the leaders of the Warren Report, wanted. It would clear the way for a new world order. Because reducing Germany to a pile of rubble, dismantling Austria-Hungary and forcing a brutal peace treaty on the vanquished, making them pay an astronomical sum of money to the victors, would spark more conflict in Europe. And while Europe self-destructed once again in World War II, a new superpower emerged, replacing the old world order with a new one. Just like the Dulles brothers wanted. When reading the Versailles Treaty, a French general remarked, this is not a peace treaty, this only delays it with 20 years. 20 years later the Second World War started. The French general's prediction had missed with only a few weeks. If you like this presentation, please like, subscribe and share this video. And I hope to see you in the next presentation.